Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for this beautiful applause. Coming here, I thought that it is true what is said, that is to say that uh, a nice day starts with a beautiful morning. This goes also for our uh, festival, because this is a wonderful beginning. And thank you for everybody who is here and who has waited patiently uh, for the beginning uh, of this event. Uh, this testifies to the fact uh, that uh, the formula of this festival is still very valid and good. And uh, this year we put together two ambitious uh, 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 words, uh, uh, the borders and uh, the freedom. And uh, you see, uh, we talk here about an opening. And if you like, this is also a festival about opening up uh, to space and time to time because, of course, uh, we have a preview today and we would like to thank so much uh, the cooperation movement in uh, Trentino for organizing this event and for joining efforts uh, with uh, a team of people, um, the University of Trento, the Municipality of Trento, clearly the province of Trento and many sponsors uh, and an audience uh, that has always been present uh, and testified to uh, their interest uh, in the festival. But we also have a special opening in that uh, today we are here in Trento and on Saturday we will have uh, an additional opening event in Naples. So you see, we are very ambitious. Uh, we want to testify to the fact that uh, this festival does not belong to a city, one only city but belongs to everybody. And then we will come back uh, to Trento, and uh, from the 2nd to 5th of June, we will have many events uh, in uh, both Trento and Rovereto. And Tito Boeri, the scientific coordinator of the festival, will soon tell you about that. But first and foremost, I would kindly ask uh, the president uh, of uh, the Trentino Cooperation, uh, Cooperatives, uh, Diego Schelfi, to uh, uh, address us. Uh, and, uh, Indeed, he will tell us about the beginning of this idea of organizing this pre-event. Good evening. You see, normally I speak extemporarily off the cuff, but this is such an important event, such an important place, that I want to be cautious, and so I will read a speech that I prepared. Professor Sen, the Trentino Cooperation Movement is honored to welcome you. We thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and we would like to thank specifically Professor Zamani for favoring this uh, uh, meeting that brings you again uh, to Trento. Continuing a tradition that started in the period when you were still uh, an Oxford student, I would like to thank the province of uh, Trento and the organizers of this festival for grasping the opportunity of promoting jointly this very prestigious preview event. And then I would like also to thank uh, the cooperative uh, consortia that together with their federation decided to support uh, this initiative. We uh, welcome you with a deep uh, sense of gratitude. We are very thankful to you, Professor Sen, for being here. And we are, due to your very uh, high scientific contribution, and uh, this also is in line with the action of so many people who search through cooperatives uh, to uh, contribute to the development of our communities. Many aspects in your research and uh, uh, reasoning represent for us a source of learning and education and also provide theoretical and operational foundations to our cooperative activity. There are a number of uh, elements uh, that we share and that are very important. First and foremost, ethics and economics or economy. Our movement has been existing for over one century and since the very beginning, it was inspired by participative organizational and managerial elements uh, that combine ethics and economic aspects. Uh, all expressions of our cooperation movement 
bases its uh, choices on the values of human solidarity, since we are convinced that economy and wealth must be uh, uh, to the service of uh, human development. And then capacity and opportunity for essential, uh, essentially ethical reasons and due to our way of understanding human and economic development, we try and bring together the capacities of people working in cooperatives at all levels with the opportunities that are created constantly in our businesses, also in this period, which is not easy, especially to offer working opportunities to young people. The modernization processes of our business networks in all sectors count on the uh, capacities not only of individuals but also of communities in order to be the protagonists of our time. Another element is that of education and democratic participation. Since the very beginning, our movement has been based on a heavy, uh, strong investment in education and training and on democratic participation on the part of each and every member of cooperatives uh, in the choices made uh, by the business. The widespread uh, education of staff, uh, managers, and administrators is today one of the activities that uh, uh, are peculiar of us uh, also I I in the national scenario. We are convinced, uh, as you also say, that knowledge is one indeed of the key uh, sources of the quality of uh, human and economic development. Then equality and justice. Your very uh, far-reaching uh, analyses of equality and justice have confirmed our belief that uh, there can be no development without due attention being paid uh, to social justice and that the principles of the equality of opportunities, also of equal opportunities, is a value that we have uh, to refer to constantly. Due to their own structure and managerial criteria that we try and promote, our cooperatives tend to constantly link the quality of their working life with economic results. And then, internal democracy and international opening. One aspect uh, of your research and studies uh, that is very important for us and that helps us really in our work is the attention you pay to the uh, decision democracy and the way of making business, both uh, in individual cooperatives uh, and at the central institutions that operate uh, uh, the service of the system. So we uh, strive and add to that an international opening which would give the opportunity to our local system to engage in a dialogue and cooperation with other realities around the world. And then I would like also to underline two aspects of the cooperation uh, scenario which we think uh, fit well in uh, uh, our debate uh, today. In this autonomous province, uh, the uh, cooperatives uh, that here uh, find their expression so much so that uh, Trentino is a cooperative district are uh, uh, businesses which were created more than 100 years ago. So they boast longevity and the sharing of values. And they were created not to maximize profit in the short term to meet the need of communities and to create value in the long and uh, medium term as well. Uh, and this is done, for instance, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the setting aside of profit as a reserve. Uh, with reference to that, please consider that cooperatives set aside reserves for the next generations for an amount of 2.6 billion. And uh, we also redistribute through uh, services uh, our profits. So we give back to the community what we earn. And these are values that are difficult to translate into numbers, but we know very well that they have a very strong impact on the life of Trentino cooperatives. Please let me tell you that uh, the uh, cooperation movement nationally and internationally and locally is not responsible of the economic crisis that started, uh, financial crisis that started in 2008. Now, I would also like to add the following. Not only did we not create the crisis or cause the crisis, rather 
in Italy, in Trentino, we really got active to solve the problem. So this lets me reiterate the fact that this crisis reflects a way of looking at society and the economy in a utilitarian way. And this is different uh, from our approach, which is based on the common good. And the common good is the good of everybody, of all people. Our businesses have uh, maintained and increased the number of uh, uh, permanently employed people uh, uh, over the past pe last period. And we also increased activities to the benefit of members and communities as well. The rural uh, banks, uh, local banks, uh, which are cooperatives also in the uh, uh, most difficult moments of the crisis, uh, gave loans uh, to businesses and uh, continued uh, acting as uh, uh, loan givers, uh, as lenders. So there is uh, one key element, which is the dignity of uh, the human person, which is always the end, never a means. Profit and efficiency, as Professor Zamani constantly uh, tells us, uh, are means, uh, not ends. So, Emeritus Professor Sen, due to all these reasons, we are very thankful to you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and being here today. And we really feel in harmony with your research and with your thought and analysis which is really uh, among the best efforts being made in trying to understand how we can achieve a better world through humane development uh, and the sharing uh, of uh, the wealth uh, and the rights of people. Thank you, President Skelfi. Uh, with reference to the topic of knowledge, I think that also President Eli would have liked uh, to share a few words with us, unfortunately, due to uh, other commitments, uh, uh, political commitments, uh, he um, could not uh, join us here today. But anyway, I would like to invite here Tito Boeri to briefly introduce this topic and specifically to tell us about the formula of the festival this year without anticipating too much because uh, really the inauguration is uh, for uh, and on uh, the 2nd of June uh, at the Buon Consiglio Castle. Well, we, I would like to thank the Trentino cooperatives for making a dream come true and bring uh, Amartya Sen uh, to the festival. So this festival, also given its title, is opened at best with Alexio Magistralis by Amartya Sen, who is one of the very few, if not the only one, together with Kenneth Arrow, among uh, modern economists uh, to pay so much attention to the relationship between freedom and economic uh, um, theory. If we look back at the history of economic thought, uh, we find a very uh, important economist uh, who wrote uh, significant things about it, uh, uh, um, Adam Smith, uh, uh, Ra, or Keynes, uh, Hayek, so, and Mill. Well, certainly there are uh, several examples that I could mention, but among mod uh, contemporary economists, uh, uh, there has not been so much attention to this very important topic. Why is it so? Uh, well, you see, economists uh, uh, took a bit of distance from this topic, perhaps uh, due to the fact that uh, political philosophy and uh, law philosophy invested so much in this theme, so much so that an economist that wants to investigate these topics has to also invest a lot in adjusting to a terminology, to a glossary that has evolved so much over time. Uh, Professor Sen indeed uh, did this investment. Uh, he, uh, had uh, also chair of philosophy at Harvard, and he was one of the few economists who could speak with Nordic, for instance, uh, or John Rawls about these topics. When I uh, sought to define uh, the program of uh, the festival, um, uh, of uh, this festival, I referred, for instance, to rationality and freedom, a volume that uh, uh, really uh, groups together, a number of lectures uh, made in Helsinki, but then also in 
1990, this one is of old, 1991 specifically. So on several opportunities, Professor Sen identified the issue and the problem. And uh, um, you see, there are two notions of freedom that are very important uh, to uh, uh, repeat. First, uh, freedom as uh, the realization of opportunities, and then freedom as a process. The first notion pertains to the actual possibility of making a choice. What counts is not so much the fact that you can do something, that, 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 that there is something, but the fact that you can achieve that. An unemployed person can choose to work, but unless there is a job, this will never come true. And then there is the issue of material deprivation of many people in uh, developing countries and also in advanced economies. And then there is the second concept, uh, freedom as a process. And there uh, we have more reference to the libertarian uh, theory, that is to say uh, the freedom of expressing and choosing uh, which clashes uh, with dictatorship uh, and constraints uh, economy. Uh, and uh, the economic uh, thought, or so economics rather, uh, sought uh, often to use reference uh, to freedom and a rhetoric of the market, which was wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, the economic uh, theory uh, specifically uh, uh, focused uh, on the relationship between market and wealth rather than uh, market and freedom. Uh, Professor Sen, investigating all these aspects, uh, provided us with a very important contribution and gave us uh, some uh, keys uh, to understand many phenomena. The market, per se, is not capable of achieving these two freedoms uh, in terms of opportunities, because often you see the market does not pay attention to uh, distribution and does not uh, refer to the distribution of income. And often the market uh, uh, does not uh, uh, is not accompanied uh, by uh, democratic systems. And this is something that we also uh, discussed in previous editions of the festival in talking about market democracy. At a certain point, we discovered Chile, a country where there is a market, but not a democracy. It was a dictatorship, but it was a, 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 an exception. And then there was this incredible exception being China, uh, a country where indeed there is a market where many sectors are market economies, but there is no democracy. And this is, these are the realities we have to, uh, to tackle, in a way. The economists uh, often did not uh, pay much attention to these topics, uh, but Professor Sen indeed did so. Economists uh, often uh, focused uh, on a practical issue, on the role of private initiative and the state and the borders between them and uh, the role of the state as well. And you see, uh, from 2nd to 5th of June, we will bring uh, to Trento a number of uh, uh, economists and researchers who focused on these aspects, uh, people who uh, uh, analyzed the role of uh, the state as being an investor in some uh, uh, in, in some domains, it has been decided today, for instance, that a specific Italian fund will finance uh, the purchasing uh, of uh, uh, cruise ships. Uh, and so we ask ourselves uh, whether that is correct or not, uh, or the state as an investor, should it uh, uh, focus on uh, education? And if so, to what extent? Uh, to what extent should students that benefit from these uh, uh, services uh, have also to contribute to this? Uh, uh, so when we talk about school fees, and then there is the function of the state as a regulator of the market. When we talk about water, we will have a new format, pros and cons, which is focused on giving the opportunity to people to uh, uh, shape an idea about uh, these important uh, um, topics. So uh, the state as a regulator, who regulates these markets, uh, who regulates when there are natural monopolies, and uh, what about the relationship between private and public utilities, for instance? And then uh, there is the role of the state being a guarantor of the social uh, uh, cohesion and pact. Uh, and here we have a very important uh, debate uh, also in relation to the recession, in that you see we have a very high public debt and all countries are trying to reduce uh, and uh, to uh, um, diminishing this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. And many states uh, think that the state should have uh, a lesser role 
in many uh, domains which were typical of the state in combating poverty in welfare state uh, uh, systems. Uh, in the project by camera of the big society, we find in a way this theory. So what are the risks that we find in this way of reviewing the borders between private and public? If you read through the program of the festival, the core part, the orange part, you will see that all debates, all discussions and meetings focus on these issues. But without further ado, we now really uh, 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 go to the core of our uh, meeting with uh, uh, the uh, with a contribution by Professor Damani and then Professor Sen and enjoy the festival. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a few minutes on my part to introduce Amartya Sen. There's no exaggeration indeed if I say that Amartya Sen is really an extraordinary uh, economist. He's an extremely distinguished representative of contemporary economic studies. As uh, Keynes and then John Hicks uh, in uh, an essay published uh, in 1941 uh, maintained, well, both Keynes and uh, this second scholar uh, say that a good economist cannot be merely an economist. Well, this seems a paradox today. Hicks used to say that a good economy economist should be also a philosopher and uh, as he particularly appreciated Italian literature he maintained that a good economist had to be a good literature expert too. It is really not possible to sum up the huge scientific contribution provided by Professor Sen's uh, studies but uh, let me just remind some key areas. One of these key areas is the theory of uh, uh, social choice. Well, I believe that if this discipline in economic uh, sciences has reached the present day uh, levels, uh, much is the result of Professor Sen's uh, studies. In 1970, Professor Sen published a contribution which then proved to be absolutely decisive. Uh, a to the Parisian uh, principle. Well, this essay was extremely intriguing because he uh, showed and he demonstrated in 1970 that there are situations in social life where the principle of democracy may come into conflict with the principle of freedom. This was called minimal freedom. Well, this creates a problem in that uh, it means that the institutional setup of a society is called upon to consider these conflicts. On the one hand, we want democracy, and on the other hand, we want uh, freedom too. And when these two principles um, come into conflict, uh, well, that means that there's something wrong in the institutional setup of a given society. Well, I believe that uh, uh, social, social choice is really one of the preeminent areas Professor Sen has dealt with, uh, underlying the need not to separate the social dimension from the political dimension. And yet we know that this has substantially been the problem over the past few years. At the beginning, we used to talk about uh, political economy to refer to our discipline. And this term is, to, is disregarded today. Well, this means that if we forget the political dimension, the discipline we are trying to study completely changes. changes. And there's also a second uh, uh, discipline uh, Professor Sen has devoted himself to, the study of poverty and inequalities. 
Well, the underlying concept here, as was anticipated by other speakers, is that poverty is not just the lack of resources or income. It is also, and particularly, lack of freedom. And here there's a fundamental distinction to be made between the two kinds of freedom, as has already been explained, which means that there's a distinction to be made between freedom as autonomy and freedom as capability, the capability to act. And this is the capabilities approach which is uh, by now uh, widely known. The underlying idea here is that uh, notion dating back uh, to 1800s actually had got uh, us to be accustomed to the idea that freedom simply meant not being invaded by others' actions, uh, which means uh, freedom, basically, as Isaiah said in one of his essays. Well, the freedom as autonomy, it's the freedom to do, for example, what he, uh, we would like to do. But this is not enough uh, unless it is matched uh, by the capability, uh, for example, in the lack of uh, uh, adequate uh, purchasing power, freedom is not enough. As Nilton Friedman said in Free to Choose, well, I believe that free to be able to choose is the new notion, because if I am free to choose, but I don't have the capability to choose, freedom remains a vague concept. And in this context, Professor Sen provided an extremely valuable contribution particularly considering a series of practical uh, applications of his uh, studies. For example, the UN Development Index. All this shows that these ideas can indeed have very, very practical implications also in the sphere of political life. But there's a third sphere, a third um, sector in which Professor um, Sen has been instrumental. That is to say, the very foundations of economic reasoning, well, for a whole series of uh, uh, reasons, Professor Sen has taught us that economy was actually born out of ethics, but this means that a particular application that it is a particular application of the ethical discourse, but we know that in time, the other, another line, another approach, maybe a so-called technocratic approach has prevailed, according to which uh, the economic world and the ethical world have nothing in common. Why that? Because economy has come to be considered to have its own ethical dimension, which means that it doesn't need to mix up with uh, ethics. What is the foundation of this separation, of this distinction? Well, it's an anthropological uh, foundation. It is really difficult to, to find a student today who has not learned that an economist is a social uh, scientists studying um, the economic human being. And of course, uh, uh, the so-called experts of ethics uh, will have to focus upon a different dimension. Well, Professor Sen has fought very, very hard against this separation. There's no sense in separating what is absolutely um, a unity in human beings, um, unless we risk uh, um, accepting very negative consequences, as we have seen. So today, we uh, have uh, a new approach, which is called experimental 
uh, economics. Well, at the time when Professor Ben uh, Sen first proposed these uh, these ideas, uh, they were uh, we were just in the very early beginnings, and this is uh, absolutely significant because uh, good ideas. Uh, will be confirmed sooner or, la or later. And Professor Sen has made the proposal to enlarge the, this economic approach, accepting the trade-off between elegant models and their value and significance is not, is not enough. And to conclude, let me tell you, uh, Professor uh, Sen has played an absolutely paramount role. Maybe we do not always agree with him, but his work deserves attention. And the spheres I have referred to are absolutely significant. And let me just remind you that there are two lines of thought. Let us talk, for example, about a philosopher, not just Aristoteles, but uh, uh, Cautilia, who was uh, actually uh, an expert in metaphysics. We try to, uh, we tend to underline this, but at the same time, almost simultaneously, in Greece and in India, similar uh, metaphysical, philosophical lines and approaches were developed. Well, there are two kinds of thought, the so-called calculating thought and the thinking thought. The calculating thought is useful in terms of problem solving, and the model of the so-called rational choice uh, is exactly based upon this dimension. Well, we absolutely need this calculating thought. But we also need another kind of thought, which is the thinking thought, showing us the direction of our lives and also of economic research in this specific instance. So let me tell you to conclude that we are extremely grateful to Professor Sen for showing us that high economic theoretical reasoning is possible without a separation between the calculating thought and the thinking thought, and we are extremely grateful to him for this. Personally, I learned a lot from him. I owe him really a lot. Thank you very much. No, okay. <laughs> well, um, it's a fantastic privilege for me to be here today, and I'm very grateful to the organizers of the festival for inviting me and for the for Tito Boyeri, and also for the cooperative um, uh, foundation here, the federation here which is acting as a host, and I'm very grateful indeed. I, I mentioned in a, in a press interview earlier that um, uh, I came to Trento for the first time many years ago. In fact, looking at the audience, I would say at the time when most people here were not born. Uh, I came here in 1954. I was then an undergraduate in Cambridge. And uh, I was um, uh, the only country in Europe I knew was Britain. And after feeling quite cooped up in England for, for nine months when the term came to an end, I saved a little money to come to Italy. In those days, I was very fascinated by Italian Renaissance painting, so I went to everywhere I could within my budget, namely uh, uh, Venice, Verona, uh, Florence, obviously, and uh, Perugia, and, and all the places, Turin, and so on, which, uh, which I could go to. But there one out of that, uh, other than that, was one bit of my political interest, and that was Trento, which I came uh, 
uh, as an activist in student politics. I, I knew something about the uh, the cooperative movement, but it wasn't. I I couldn't see so much on the ground at that time. I was there only two days. I stayed in a youth hostel up top of Hill here, and um, so it's it's really a wonderful thing for me to come back again after a uh, gap of what now uh, six almost sixty years, nearly sixty years, and see after all see the cooperative movement in action. So I'm very grateful for the invitation, for the hospitality, and for the kindness, and also very grateful for the very kind, welcoming statement that came from both the cooperatives and from Professor Boyery. So thank you very much. And of course, Stefano Zamani, he's too old a friend to be entirely objective. Uh, so I mustn't take everything he says so kindly to be exactly true. On the other hand, I don't protest about that. It's always pleasing to hear. I'm not a utilitarian, but there is a sneaking sympathy I have for wanting pleasure. And it's always nice to hear <laughs> Stefano, uh, even when he is being more than kind in, in describing my work. So, Stefano, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the title of my talk is um, The Reach and Limits of Economic Freedom. So I'll launch on to that. Hopefully, there will be a little time for Q&A at the end. Not long ago, in the 80s and the 90s, profit-making capitalism seemed a triumphant. Businesses were all booming. All in old capitalist economies, economies in the West, as well as in the new centers in the East of China and East Asia, of course, earlier Japan. The enemies of the capitalist ideo ideology were humbled. Even the welfare state was frequently portrayed as an euphemism for profligate spending. And government bureaucrats were accused of squandering hard-earned money of the taxpayers in the name of pursuing public welfare. The effectiveness of the market economy and the power of capital had become the central message by then. Even though the American and European economies had many problems in the first half of the 20th century, including experiencing the greatest depression, the, or the Great Depression of the 1930s, still the greatest of recent history, in the long haul after the end of the Second World War, the market economy was exceptionally dynamic, generating unprecedented expansion of the global economy over the last 60 years. It all seemed to be going up and up for the market economy, which looked magnificently grand. Since then, things have certainly changed. 2008 was the year of economic crisis. Not the first one in this period, but certainly by a long margin the most noticeable and large in this post-war period. There was first a food crisis over the 2000 year, it was indeed a year of crises. Food crisis first, an oil crisis later, and finally, in, as the summer months ended, came the beginning of a gigantic recession. For a while, the world capitalist economy seemed to be in something of a free fall, with a spiraling rise in unemployment, widespread bankruptcy, or near bankruptcy, of not only banks and industrial enterprises, but also of individuals, with frequent loss of people's homes for failure to pay, make mortgage payments. These adversities occurred to people even in the richest country of the world, namely the United States. There was a huge collapse of business confidence, as well as the confidence of consumers about their own economic future. To stop, stop the free fall, a appeal had to be made to what was seen as, quote unquote, the old enemy, the state. And there was need for government finance, rescue effort, in gigantic scale, to shore up, to shore up, to repair the economies of hard-hit countries and of the world. The free fall had certainly stopped 
I think the big bailouts and powerful declarations by the states of the world that they would not allow the recession to turn into a real slum played a major part. Perhaps the turning point as we look back was the, at the global level, was the meeting of G20 countries in London in April 2009, convened by Prime Minister Gordon Brown. The economic world is still not back to normality, and unemployment continues to remain high, particularly in parts of Europe and America. And some countries, such as Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, are facing persistent threat of possible disasters to come. There's little doubt that the prime mover in the economic crisis of the world that has engulfed us since 2008 was irresponsible action, particularly in the United States, by many financial institutions and businesses, which made the pursuit of quick profit take priority over prudence and over security. At a time, we have to recollect the time, of relatively cheap money, particularly fed by the Chinese trade surpluses, which for some reason the Chinese wanted to keep abroad, thereby the world was awash with easy cash. The new instruments of electronic trade, uh, the various kinds of derivatives and other mechanisms came in, lubricated the process of relentless and careless expansion of financial institutions because these derivatives and other instruments made it particularly difficult to pin responsibility. And these institutions themselves were shining in the glitter of its imagine, of its supposed prosperity. This free-ranging um, liberty being taken about, uh, about uh, trade, unregulated trade, was helped by fairly comprehensive deregulation that had gone on in the United States since the days of President Ronald Reagan. But followed by all su successive U.S. presidents, Democrats as well as Republicans, right up to George W. Bush, firms exercised unregulated freedom to take economic action even when it endangered their clients as well as ultimately themselves. Faced with the problems that the world is encountering today, there are many questions that come up. There are two questions on which I'm going to concentrate, which are often asked. One concerns capitalism, and the other is the idea of economic freedom. The first question takes the form of asking, what reform does capitalism need? How should we get a new capitalism, more sturdy, more robust, and more efficient, and also more caring and humane? The second question is about the idea of economic freedom. Should we not limit economic freedom for the sake of the efficiency and equity and the security of the economic world? Both the questions are important to consider since they point to really serious issues that seem to make, at least apparently, some immediate sense. However, I would argue that both the questions may be rather badly posed and indeed misleading. And I have to say, economics is not only about answering questions well, it's also about asking the right questions. So that is the direction in which I shall try to go first even as I try to respond to the reasoned curiosity that underlined, um, understandable reasoned curiosity that underlined these rather ill-posed questions. I begin by asking, should we be seeking some new kind of capitalism? I even attended a conference two years ago, 2009, in in Paris, organized by President Sarkozy, along with Chancellor Merkel and former Prime Minister Tony Blair. One difficulty 
in talking about new capitalism, which I also said in the meeting, is that it's not altogether clear what the essential requirements are for an economy to count as quote-unquote capitalism. If the present economic system is to be reformed, what would make the reform system a new capitalism rather than a new something else? What are the special characteristics, the presence of which makes an economic system indubitably capitalist, old or new? If you look at textbooks, it's clear, economic textbooks, it's clear that relying on the market for economic transactions is meant to be something like a necessary qualification, the litmus test for an economy to be seen as capitalist. And in a similar way, dependence on the profit motive and on individual entitlements based on private ownership are seen as archetypic, archetypal features of capitalism. However, if these are necessary requirements of capitalism, the litmus test, are the economic systems we currently have, for example, in Europe and America, genuinely capitalist. <laughs> All affluent countries in the world, those in Europe as well as in USA, Canada, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Australia, and others, have depended for quite some time now on transactions that occur largely outside the market, in addition to market transactions, such as unemployment benefits, public pensions, other features of social security, the provision of school education, some places university education, health care, and a variety of other services distributed through non-market uh, arrangements. The economic entitlements connected with these transactions are very often not based on private ownership and property rights. Also, the market economy has depended for its own working not only on private ma profit maximization, but also on many other motivations, some of which I have restrained and modified the unrestrained search for profit. And there have been also regulatory institutions until from the Reagan administration onward, they began to be dismounted in, in the United States. The creditable performance of the alleged capitalist system in the days when things moved forward rather than backward, drew on a combination of institutions that went much beyond relying only on profit-maximizing market economy and on personal entitlements confined to private ownership. Underlying this issue is a more basic question, whether capitalism is a term that is of particular use today. Grand labels generate their own excitement, and people have stakes in what we, call, what we may call the insignia, in addition to the ideas with which the insignias are ancestrally associated in origin. The idea of capitalism did, in fact, play an important role historically, but that usefulness may well now be fairly exhausted. For example, the pioneering works of Adam Smith, and uh, was, uh, people were referred to that, and it was present in Zamani's presentation to, in the 18th century, in support of what came to be called capitalism, showed the usefulness and dynamism of the market economy, and why, and particularly how, that dynamism worked. It was one of the greatest episodes in economic history of economic ideas. Smith's causal investigation provided an illuminating diagnosis just when the dynamism of the market economy was powerfully emerging, and the contribution that the Wealth of Na Nations published in 1776 made to the understanding of this part of economics, among others, was absolutely monumental. Smith showed how the freeing of trade can very often be extremely helpful in generating economic prosperity 
through specialization in production and division of labor and in making good use of economies of large scale. Those lessons remain deeply relevant even today, and I will, I believe, will continue to remain relevant in the future. The economic analysis that followed those early expositions of markets and capital in the 18th century have succeeded in solidly establishing the understanding of the rationale of the market system in the corpus, within the corpus of mainstream economics. However, even as the positive contributions of capitalism through the market processes and profit motives were being clarified and explicated, its negative sides were also becoming clear, often to the very same analysts, including Adam Smith. While a number of socialist critics, most notably Karl Marx, influentially would discuss the case for censoring and ultimately supplanting capitalism. This would occur in the 19th century, as you know. Even to Adam Smith in the 18th century, the Adam Smith, the trailblazing exponent of the rationale of the market economy, the huge limitations of relying entirely on the market economy and only on the profit motives were also absolutely clear. Indeed, early advocates of the use of markets, including Adam Smith, did not take pure market mechanism to be a freestanding performer of excellence. Nor did he take the profit motive to be all that is needed. He did point out that self-interest may be sufficient to explain why we seek trade. And there are about a page and a half about the butcher, baker, and brewer, why they seek trade which many people who want to read only that part of Smith quote. And, and I, I, I admire in many ways many things happened in Chicago economics, but insofar as we think of it as quintessentially narrowly market economics, that's the only thing that of Smith that seems to be mostly quoted, or used to be. The world is changing somewhat. The, while um, Smith went on to say that while that may be sufficient to seek trade, what makes trade and business relations sustainable, effective, and efficient requires other types of motivation. To give an example, something quite related to the 2008 crisis when people, the banks, lost confidence in the financial system and indeed on each other. And this is what Smith was saying in 1776, when the people of any particular country have such confidence in the fortune, probity, and prudence of a particular banker as to believe he is always ready to pay upon demand such of his promissory notes as are likely to be at any time presented to him, those notes come to have the same currency as gold and silver money from the confidence that such money can at any time be had for them. Unquote. Smith went on to explain why this not, not, need not always happen and may not be automatic. And he would have found nothing particularly puzzling, I would suggest, in the difficulties faced today by banks and businesses, thanks to the psychology of fear and continuing mistrust of each other that prevented for a long time, and is still not fully completed, the unfreezing of credit markets and an adequately coordinated expansion of business in many countries of the world, which is yet to take place. More generally, Smith argued that we need a mixture of motivation, not just self-interest pursuit. Indeed, in many contexts, he argued exactly the opposite of the simulated, imagined Smith. I quote from Smith. While prudence is of all virtues that which is most helpful to the individual, we have to look to generosity, public spirit, and as the qualities most useful to others. Smith's faith in the importance of cooperation 
and this is extremely important to bear in mind in the, in the context of debates here in Trentino, he remained strong even as he was explaining the positive but limited role of self-interest and the positive and limited role of the pure market mechanism. It's also worth mentioning in this context, especially since the welfare state that would emerge later in Europe was far away in Smith's own time, that in his various writings, Smith's overwhelming concern and worry about the fate of the poor and the disadvantage is strikingly prominent. The most immediate failure of the market mechanism lies in omissions rather than commissions, the things that the market leaves undone. Smith's economic analysis went well beyond leaving everything in the hands of the market mechanism. He was not only a defender of the role of the state in providing public services such as education and in poverty relief, the only thing where he disagreed with the poor laws he complained that it gave too little freedom to those who receive these benefits under the poor law laws. They're given draconian con control. They can't leave their area, can't go anywhere else. He was, Smith was deeply concerned about the inequality and poverty that might survive in an otherwise successful market economy. At one stage he says, I'm going out of the script here now, says that what about public intervention? And then he comes to marvelous generalization. Smith liked making great generalization. He wasn't a very modest speaker. Uh, he felt strongly. And he said, well, on reflection, I come around to the view that nearly every intervention that the state makes in the interest of the poor turns out to be right. And nearly enter every intervention that the state makes in the interest of the rich turns out to be wrong. And his main complaint was most of the intervention in his time was in the interest of the rich. That was the point he was making. He was not making the point that interventions are invariably bad. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Despite all Smith did to explicate the contribution of the market, oh, sorry, did I have gone through it? Uh, <laughs> I might have. <laughs> uh, um, now, he addressed these issues and called for different social arrangements and pointed to the importance of motivation other than profit, that I've said. Now, um, Smith never used the term capitalism, and it would be hard to carve out from his work any theory of the sufficiency of the market economy or the need to accept the dominance of capital, capital of which neither of which he believed in. The present economic crisis is partly generated by a huge overestimation of the wisdom of the market processes that include ruleless overactivism in pursuit of business gain. And the crisis is now being actively fed by nervousness and anxiety in the financial market and in businesses in general. As it happens, both these limitations were already identified in the 18th century, as I said, by Adam Smith. These are very old and well as understood problems, even though they have been neglected by those who have been in authority, especially in the United States, but also in many parts of Europe, who have been so busy, when it comes to Smith, quoting selected passages, especially the thing about the butcher, Brewer, Brewer uh, and, the, and, the, and the baker, that they haven't had time clearly to read the rest of his writings. Smith wanted institutional diversity and motivational variety, not monolithic markets, nor singular domination of the profit motive. Markets and capital were seen as doing good work within their context, but they required support from other affirmative institutions for the pursuit of well-being and freedom of the people. And second, the market needed restraint and correction from still other institutions for preventing inefficiency, inequity, injustice, and insecurity. Smith talked about the tendency of those whom he called prodigals and projectors to take excessive risk in pursuit of quick profit. And while Jeremy Bentham will argue with him 
when Smith said that leaving borrowing and lending entirely in, in the hands of the market is a mistake. He was in favor of intervention. There's a very funny episode where Bentham wrote to Smith explaining to the principal economists of his time, and possibly of all time, how the market economy works. There, the political philosopher, barely educated in economics, a good political philosopher at University College, writing to the primary economist in the world on how the market economy works. And Smith didn't reply, but said very kind things. I think he spoke to someone that he's, he writes in such a kind way to me. How can one get angry? And Bentham was so happy for agreement, he said, I take that to mean that he agrees with me. Of course, he said nothing of the kind. He said he was not going to rebut the charges. That's all he said. But here was Smith arguing for intervention. Bentham telling him the market is always right. And in this respect, Ronald Reagan was following Jeremy Bentham, not Adam Smith. So the right way of thinking of the question is not, to conclude the, uh, my analysis of the first question, not what kind of a reform capitalism is needed. Don't ask a question about capitalism. Don't try to define it. I think follow Smith. Don't use the word. What kind of a balance between institutions and the market, institutions of the market and those of the state, and those of corporations should we be seeking? What balance? That's the question. And if it goes against ideologues of either capitalism or socialism, not to be able to identify it with one of the system, well, that's unfortunate. But the real questions are about the balance of institutions, not the name by which you would like to call it. There's a similar need for re-examining and reformulating the second question, that about economic freedom. Armed with the lessons of our experience, do we really want to argue against the importance of economic freedom, since the business houses and the banks taking too much economic freedom has messed up the world? Or, alternatively, demand a fuller understanding of freedom in general, and economic freedom in particular. I would argue strongly for the second approach. Any people-centered approach must be concerned with the importance of the lives that we lead. If our concentration has to be on the actual lives of people, the question that immediately arises is how to understand the richness and poverty of human lives. There is, a, there, there is thus a powerful case for attaching importance that freedom, that people, human beings, actually enjoy. Very much in line with both Adam Smith's concern with the real opportunity that we have, and also with the kind of free life that attracted, clearly attracted Karl Marx so much, so strongly, right from his early work in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscript of 1844. What are the things we are really free to do and free to be? These are the central questions. What are our real capabilities? And in my work, particularly, well, going back, but uh, in, in development as freedom, but also in, the, in my last book, The Idea of Justice, both of which is published by Mondadori. They're available in English translation. I think my publisher was very upset that the only English title was given. The other Italian translations were mentioned, but not the Mondadori <laughs> translation. <laughs> and since I would like you to see the book, I'm not necessarily asking you to buy it, the cheapest way of getting a book is to borrow it from the library. I would like you to know that there is an Italian translation of most of my books, and that applies to development of freedom and the idea of justice as well. An adequately capacious understanding of freedom and justice differs sharply from many other approaches to narrower views of freedom and from assessing the demands of justice in an over-restricted framework. The latter may take us toward, for example, the
the fulfillment of certain formal rights, certain formal permissions and freedoms that people should have on which institutional libertarians focus, whether or not these rights can be actually exercised. Are you prevented from doing it? If you're not, well, then you're free to do it. Libertarian thinking thinkers are very tempted by this limited approach. Many of the libertarian rights can, of course, have an instrumental role in advancing more free social lives. That we mustn't deny. Being allowed to do what you want to do is a very important thing. But the pursuit of justice can hardly stop there. It is, for example, to give a rather extreme example, it's, for example, nice and reassuring to know that the state would not prevent a destitute from going to Capri or Acapulco to have a good holiday, no matter how implausible it might be even to consider that possibility. What prevents a person from doing that is not that anyone is trying to stop you, but that you don't have the cognitive ability to do it. The society has to go a bit beyond securing the individual's right to do what they can do uh, on their own without interference or help from others. The state has to consider what the society and the state can reasonably do to facilitate the freedom of the people to do what actually they have reason to value. I think this connection, the complementarity between the, individual, uh, the, between the individual freedom and state was the subject of a talk I had to give in Turin, actually, almost more than 15 years ago, uh, when I got the Agnelli uh, Prize in, uh, uh, and on modern ethics. Uh, I think it came out as a volume, uh, as an article by the Anelli Foundation, but also La Terza has, a collect I think, a two-paper collection in which that's one of them. And I discuss why state has a role in cultivating individual freedom in particular. Because not to think of individual versus society would be a great mistake. Um, having the freedom to be educated, to escape hunger, to avoid poverty, to get medical attention when it is needed, to have decent jobs, to other such affirmative opportunities uh, are matters of freedom, and even of economic freedom. Freedom cannot but be important in any people-centered social analysis, but it has to be taught in an adequately broad way. So I think the wrong reaction to the libertarian attempt to capture the whole of the idea of freedom is to say economic freedom is not all that important. It's quite the contrary. It's very important, but the, the permission to do things is not the only complement of freedom. In pursuing the perspective of freedom, there are, of course, many difficulties to be addressed and problems to be resolved, some of which I do discuss in my book, The Idea of Justice. Freedom, indeed, has many aspects, many faces. Um, Professor Zamani discussed uh, some of them. He also kindly referred to an early paper of mine, which I was always embarrassed me because it's about a three-page paper and generated about 500 papers in response. Uh, I got certainly a huge bump for my per line, but that was also about a conflict. I would put it slightly differently from the summary statement that Zamani did, but basically that's correct too. Namely, democracy in terms of the exercise of political freedom and unanimity in terms of your utility could conflict. But utility and pursuit of happiness is also a freedom. So there is a kind of conflict that we are looking at, and freedom has many of them. We have to, there's no way of avoiding them. They are all part of the story. Economics would be a very uninteresting subject if all it dealt with were things that all go together. The interesting questions arise when they do not. And we'll get our help from different theories, including from libertarian theory. For example, in dealing with the issue of torture and its unacceptability as a means to other allegedly more important ends, 
pursued in the contemporary world by some of the leaders of the global establishment in the name of security. In raising one's voice against freedom, uh, against torture, what would be particularly important is to see the relevance here, in this case, of classical libertarian aspects of freedom, arguing for immunity of every human being from forcible infliction of pain and humiliation by others, including by the state. John Stuart Mill's On Liberty will be particularly important here, as will be Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. There's a greater relevance of other aspects of freedom when the focus is instead on issues of economic and social advantage, and in general, on the inequality of the lives that different people are able or not able to lead in a society. These aspects of freedom can be captured better by a fuller assessment of what has now come to be called in the new literature capability, with which I have been very much associated since my first paper on that in 1979. And capability reflects the actual opportunity the person has to do this or be that, think that he or she may value doing or being. I don't claim, don't claim originality in this. Uh, idea of capability. It, it, I try to refine it and clean it up, but the idea goes back to Aristotle, goes back to, in India, to Ashoka's ed edict. You refer to 4th century BC Indian thinker Kautilna. This is 3rd century BC when he was talking about the importance of what you can actually do, and which is also why he was trying to set up hospitals and, 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 and schools. Um, which, in the third century BC, which reflects the, I mean, he was a Buddhist emperor, by the way, which reflects the actual opportunities a person has, has to do this or be that, think that he or she may value doing or being. Obviously, the things we value most are particularly important for us to able to achieve. But going beyond getting what we value most, the very idea of freedom, being able to choose also respects our being free to determine what we want, what to value, ultimately what we decide to choose. I have to say, since I see myself as a part of left in politics, that I was always very shocked when I found that there is an attempt to say that freedom of choice is not important at all. It's not at all the case. It's never been so. My complaint about Mil Milton Friedman's book about free to choose isn't that free to choose is unimportant, but he doesn't discuss it. Basically, he translates into a utility problem. You have to look at Hayek or Mill to understand what free to choose really is, and not to Milton Friedman, who remains a crypto right-wing utilitarian rather than a libertarian in this respect. Not at all a libertarian, in fact, I would say. There is a room in all this for celebrating the importance of being free, actually free, not just having the permission to be free. And that's the big distinction, if there is one distinction between the left and right, between the right libertarian and the left supportive freedom view. That's the distinction. To do what we have reason to do, even to change our pursuit when reason suggests that. But that does not in any way reduce the importance of the freedom of choice. In Karl Marx's defense of the importance of individual freedom of choice, this comes not from the 1844 manuscript, though there are passages there too, but it comes from the German ideology, jointly written with Frederick Engels. Marx argues, I quote from him, the conditions argues for the conditions for the free development and activity of individuals being under their control. In another passage, he talks about it is to make the um, um, individual master over chance rather than chance master over the individual. Marx goes on to note 
this is his view of an ideal life, very romantic life. As Marx says, well, it's a very romantic passage, I might say. <laughs> I quote from Marx. Then it is possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have in mind, without becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic, unquote. Lovely passage. Also brings out how much of an urban intellectual Marx was. Um, I think rearing cattle in the evening might defeat many cattle goers, including those who produce much of the milk I gather in Trentina, namely the cooperatives. The Marx was very much more in his element in when he talks about criticize after dinner. That was definitely his territory. But what you're seeing here is not a celebration only of variety, but also of the choice that you could choose. And here, actually, I'm going out of the script. Here, he is taking up a tension in Smith. I'm, I'm really completely out of the script, but I can't resist it. Smith discusses the enormous benefit of specialization economies of scale. He explains whole of the trade in terms of specialization. His belief is that everyone has the same skill, the specialization. I mean, he was a great naturist, not a naturist. Everyone has the same skill. Education makes a difference. Learning by job this makes a difference. And if you specialize in different things, you get very good at it. And that's how we have become prosperous. But then he is very wise. But then when you specialize, you may end up doing the same thing again and again. Some of you who have, might have seen Charlie Chaplin's movie called Modern Times may remember the same person doing tightening of a bolt. The first person to discuss that is Smith in The Wealth of Nations, that he knows people who does nothing other than doing something to the head of his crew throughout his life every day from morning till evening. He leaves it there because he shows that there is a real problem to be addressed. He was basically asking here for a balance. Division of labor, specialization will raise productivity, but also diminish our life. What shall we do? And what Marx is doing here is elaborating on that Smithian thought, pointing out why doing different things is important, but the freedom of choice itself is also very important. I'd like to conclude, therefore, that the main task is not to limit our freedoms in any way, but to expand them as much as possible for everyone. The celebration of freedom is an immensely important cause for all of us. But what we have to do is to liberate the idea of freedom from being imposed in a narrowly political view of freedom as permission. There is much to discuss in defense of freedom, and I would argue much to fight for even today. Thank you. Well, the person who was supposed to take the floor now is actually has actually become a sort of an a director of an orchestra. Um, well, I thought we would have a debate now. So if there are any questions, please be brief and Professor Sen will be delighted to answer them. Could we have a microphone, please? 
for our public. Sono stato molto sol yes, thank you very much. Uh, you made a series of historical references. Uh, you made reference uh, to some important theoreticists uh, and referred to the limitations of market economy. What do you think, what is your view about uh, present, the present day debate in Italy uh, about the possibility of changing Article 41 in our Constitution. It is one of the basic rules for our economic uh, uh, system. It was created to enable our society 60 years ago to create a balance between economy, social choices, and interventions on the part of public institutions. Uh, perhaps this debate uh, uh, is one of the frequent strategies at the time to conceal uh, an attack against our institutions. Uh, please bear with me if I make uh, reference to such a specificity in Italy, but don't you believe too that the time has uh, come to put an end to this attempt uh, of uh, destroying uh, the heritage we received uh, from uh, previous generations. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm not going to answer a question specifically about Article 41 because I haven't even read it. Uh, there is a statement that development economists, I've heard one development economist tell another, you can't write about a country unless you have flown above it in broad daylight at least once. So I think you have to have some acquaintance of the, of the thing to be able to comment. But you ended with a very general point. Is it very important to respect the heritage which was born of um, thirst of freedom in the world in which Italy played a very big part my own father-in-law, my late wife's father, Eugenio Coloni, was killed in that as a member of the resistance when he was editing the underground Avanti. Uh, and uh, I'm very aware that people gave their lives for freedom and for, for liberty of various kinds. And these are important things. So I'm very much with you in preserving this heritage. Um, uh, on the other hand, I am not, and let me make it clear, I don't want to see a, a headline tomorrow morning in the paper saying I said something on Article 40, 41. I have said nothing on Article 41, other than saying I will say nothing on Article 41. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, my question refers to the freedom of information. In your book, uh, Freedom and Globalization, 10 years ago, you were making a relation between uh, economic growth and freedom of information. Uh, well, over the past few years, we have been witnessing a real information chaos an incredible increase of information to the extent that during the crisis we could not realize that uh, a great deal of information was actually fiction. Um, so the crisis was exploding and we, di we did not even realize it. We have a serious information problem in this country because uh, we have uh, substantial economic problems and information is fiction. You were making a reference between these two notions. Uh, and why? This is my question. Why don't you think, uh, uh, why do you think uh, uh, this notion of yours was not embraced at the international level and also the national level as far as my country is concerned? Well, I'm not um, able to comment on whether any notion of mine was adopted or not adopted because, you know, um, most things that I say are not adopted anyway, anyway. So I'm quite realistic on that. But I don't want to be megalomaniac in seeing a really serious issue that you're raising in terms of myself. Um, so 
What about this issue of flow of information, including, I would characterize some of the, what you described as in information which proved to be false, I would describe as misinformation. But the question is, what's the remedy of misinformation? The remedy of misinformation is more information, surely. It's not that we are blinded by information, it's just that we are deceived by economic use of information and by distortion. So I think I've been a fighter for more freedom of information, more freedom of the media, lack of censor, uh, um, um, estuary of censorship, and, and uh, in the context of the country which, of which I'm a citizen, namely in India, we have made a, a reasonable amount of progress. The Right to Information Act, led by Oruna Ray, a great visionary um, activist. Uh, she been led that movement for decades with small people like me uh, joining and supporting her. Uh, the parliament passed a bill whereby, which is playing an enormously important part at this, now, at this time now with these trials connected with corruption. India had a lot of corruption, so had many countries. I had the privilege to work as one of the advisors to the Anti-Mafia Commission here, which Mr. Violante was then chairing. And I did see some of the evidence of corruption here too. But one of the great aid had been the Freedom of Information Act, and particularly when it comes to government corruption, because any individual has a right to seek the background to, to to those things which are not protected on grounds of national security. And then the court has a role to judge whether it is indeed uh, should be so protected or not. So I think these are early days. But my prejudice is, and I'm delighted you asked the question, my prejudice is to argue for more information, not to withdraw anything I said in 1999 book, Development of Freedom, but to argue that the problem of misinformation is lies in seeking more information, less restriction by the government, by others. Now, not all restrictions come from the government. Sometimes the newspapers may have hesitation carrying the news. I think that problem is exaggerated, but it does exist. And then we have to seek what are the new channels. Now, this is again a cooperative movement can play a hugely important part. In, in making more news available um, without being uh, dependent on one business house or another. So I would say that in every way, the broader we can make the informational base, more um, fortunate we are in pursuing economic and social arguments. That's the direction I tend to go. Uh, there, there could have been a longer answer to that, but given the nature of time, and the fact that there may be other questions, I think I must stop there on that. No, 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 no. which is indeed a bottom-up news narrative. No, uh, <laughs> because I don't know much about it. You know, I think I'm always surprised when I'm asked questions about some place which I've just come to and about which there are great experts sitting in the room. And I would like to know more about it, so I make a request. You send me some material on the Ecclesita, and I'll read it, okay? And then maybe you and I will have a cup of coffee together and chat on that. <laughs> Thank you. Prego. Actually, actually, Professor Sen, my question is related to degrowth, decroissance. So my, I wonder what's your opinion on what will the future of our ability, freedom to choose, be 
in respect to a shrinking degree of freedom that our environment gives us in the future. Can you elaborate? Yeah, so I'm theoretically able to choose, and uh, there are many possibilities. I can choose to fly to London by plane, or I can choose to go there by train, which is quite right. But in the future, I expect that these choices will be more and more limited because of the effects that the environment is posing, and et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder what's your take on this? Um. <laughs> he had a much more complicated answer in mind. But my answer is very simple. Uh, you know, I think there are two things to say on this. One is that we do know that freedoms of various kinds may sometimes conflict with each other. We are very lucky when they don't. And then we can go wholeheartedly for it. But sometimes they do. The freedom of taking individual actions may sometimes go against the interests of others. Old classic cases, shouting fire in a theater like this may enhance your freedom to freedom of speech. On the other hand, reduce the freedom of survival of many people here. So you're thinking of one freedom against another. That's the territory in which we live. The environmental reasoning to the extent that they are plausible, are plausible because the environmental um, um, irresponsibility and environmental decline and non-sustainability reduces our freedom dramatically, especially of the people coming in the future. Given that, we are trying to preserve that freedom, and if that requires less freedom of a certain kind, like your freedom to travel by train or by airplane, you have to balance which way to go. Do I know, is there a general formula which must tell us how to judge? No, because there are complex considerations, complex benefits, complex valuation that people have to look at. And I think what we are looking for, I appreciate your question very much, because I'd like to think you and others to think about it. But I don't think it's a question that admits of a formulaic answer, the do this or do that. My second point is that I had a teacher called Theo Schraffer from Italy, who, um, uh, who is quite important in my book and the idea of justice also. <laughs> I think it was important in my work. And one thing he told me when I first arrived, he was my first director of studies. It must have been about the first month or so. I was sitting, not quite at his feet, but sitting almost at his feet intellectually in his room. And we were stacking, talking, but he was very interested in what I studied in Calcutta and so on. He had immense curiosity. And then he said, look, uh, uh, I, you know, I asked him, are there some things, I mean, I'm excited about coming to Cambridge, learning economics, what should I know? And then he laughed for a while, and he said, you know, you have to recognize one danger is that you've come to a city where no one is content with their economic theory until that economic theory had been converted into a slogan. And I think it gave me a great insight <laughs> into not only Cambridge economics, but a lot of economics too. And I'm not going to give you a slogan in response to the conflict of freedom. I think we have to examine, and that's the theory, that they can conflict, they can affect the lives of different people to different extents for different reasons. And any uh, the reason, uh, the, uh, the, the particular argument for public reasoning, which is the main thing that I celebrate in my book, Idea of Justice, is that these you cannot sort out without the public reasoning. You have to know who would be affected, by how much, and so on. And to the extent that you cannot guess those uncertainties, as there is in the case of environment, what's the best guess? What are the circumstances you take into account? And then in the case of environment, not only the best guess, what kind of catastrophes may follow if 
you go get it wrong. All these questions come into rational thinking, not rational sort of theory, which you rightly denounce, ra rational thinking about people's freedom. So what I am recommending is public reasoning about freedom, not a formula that I can share or a slogan, uh, because I don't believe that there is such a slogan and such a, or such a formula. a very similar question to the previous one. I want to reiterate that because I think that it's important to say that in an economic context uh, that economists uh, recently especially uh, take into account uh, the natural borders when they uh, propose uh, economic models and propose economic theories. Uh, I think that our model of developed taking into account freedom but not the natural constraints and boundaries uh, that so, uh, uh, would you further comment on the uh, trade-off between democracy and freedom? Would you please provide us with examples about uh, the cases when freedom and democracy can clash in contrast one with the other? You know, I think that <laughs> the only thing in Stefano Zamani's overkind and very kind presentation, I don't totally acknowledge is that it is a con it's best I, I can see that it could be seen as a conflict with democracy and freedom just as Kenneth Harold's impossibility theorem sometimes is seen as impossibility of democracy but I think that's the that's the immediate thought there and ultimately that's not the conflict democracy is about I think as John Stuart Mill did more than anyone else to make us understand, is government by discussion, of which there's a long tradition in different parts of the world, which I discussed fairly extensively in my book, The Idea of Justice. And democracy is not the same thing as unanimity of self-interest. There is a conflict between unanimity of self-interest and the freedom of people and the particular example I gave was a conflict between unanimity of self-interest on one side and um, libertarian freedom of the person. Now, in some ways I was extending John Stuart Mill's point. John Stuart Mill has discussed quite extensively and brilliantly in his book on liberty that even the majority decision may not be justified if it violates the very important rights of minorities. So that is a conflict between liberty and democracy in the sense of majority vote. What I was showing, and it may appear, and it's rather complex technical thought, that it goes not only go against majority, unanimity, including the same person whose liberty is being violated, not judged in terms of what he or she would like to see done, but in terms of her self-interest. So that there is a conflict between unanimity of self-interest on one side and the, unan and the unanimity of political agreement, which is democracy on the other side. So I wouldn't say this as a conflict between democracy and freedom, and I'm ready to argue with Stefano as to which of these two perspectives makes sense, and I would argue for mine. But the I think we shouldn't really think about that. The other question you're raising was really important, namely that there are barriers involved, and to the extent that you think of national democracy, the pursuit of freedom um, across the world, and the pursuit of what the <coughs> population of a certain nation wants, could go against, and that is a conflict between democracy and global well-being. Nothing surprising in that. I think the, uh, the, the, the issue there is not, in my judgment, to get imprisoned, as John Rawls does, I believe, in giving the idea of justice uh, a, a legitimacy only within the context of a nation, and look for other concerns like humanitarianism, 
basic decency for other things. Because I think concerns of justice are also involved in issues of global injustice. That doesn't mean there's no distinction between one citizen and another citizen, of one country and another. And indeed, no economic system would be viable if that distinction didn't exist. On the other hand, I believe Smith is right, which is why I'm a Smithian rather than a Hobbesian social contract, that you have to not only see what it looks like to people around you, but also what a person far away will think of that. To both avoid being too self-centered and also being too parochial, because your own culture may make you insensitive to certain things, which, uh, you know, which, uh, this is very, very important. Americans don't want European ref reference to Europe when it comes to capital punishment. And Justice Scalia of the Supreme Court is famously on record and having said that why should European arguments affect our decision as to whether uh, capital punishment is right or wrong. Now that's a position which is directly opposed to the Smithian point of view, that if there's a good reason coming from elsewhere, you have to listen to. If you're really interested in that particular aspect, I do have a paper which was my lecture in the Oxford Law Faculty called um, Herbert Hart Lecture, and it's called Rights, um, um, uh, Rights Language and Words, and it's coming out in the Journal of or uh, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies in, in, in September. Um, but I think there are all kinds of conflicts of this kind that are present. But my sympathy is basically with Smith, which is neither to say take a global social contract, which some people have tried to uh, argue for. There's a whole school of global social contract theorists. I think that's really unrealistic. And the social contract approach, in my judgment, isn't the right approach anyway. But that's not an argument for not listening to a point of view coming from elsewhere. You have to then judge how much importance you want to attach. Are you ashamed to do what you're doing, or are you not ashamed? These are the issues to be raised. So I'm in favor of public discussion on that. And that is not a barrier uh, that has to go ac across a debate between democracy and freedom. That is democracy, and that is the pursuit of freedom, namely, among other things, the freedom to discuss, the freedom to consider argument, freedom to decide what you would like to see. Ultimately, as thinking human beings, we are interested in reasoning, and ultimately, as social human beings, we are interested in reasoning of other people, and would like to know, would like to think about them, and then decide what I want to know. That's what my book, The Idea of Justice, that's what the problematique of the book is. Ecco, il nostro incontro ora giunge al termine. Finish our meeting. So we are coming to a close. We are extremely thankful to Amartya Sen. And I would like to conclude by saying the following. In, in a letter uh, from uh, Pareto to Pantaleone, he wrote, don't you think, Matteo, that all our theoretical construction in economics uh, is little useful in uh, solving uh, the problems of society? Don't you think that our theories uh, are simply words? So you see, if Pareto wrote that after inventing the Paritian uh, criteria, well, probably if he had he been here tonight, he would have not written those words in that letter. Thank you so much, Amartya. Thank you again. <laughs>